Okay, so our next speaker uh, is Melissa Lariano. She, she's an M13 and a Meyerhoff graduate fellow, and she's doing her work uh, at the uh, University of Maryland Medical School downtown, a few blocks from here. And um, she's working in David Weber's lab. And the title is uh, Structure Activity Relationships of uh, Small Molecules Interfering with the S100B P53 Interaction. Good morning. So this is what I'll be presenting this morning. So S100 beta is a homodimer protein found elevated in many different forms of cancer, including malignant melanoma, renal cell carcinomas, et cetera. And in these cancers, especially, S100 beta is used as a determinant for prognosis in a, in a cancer patient in a clinical setting. Due to the structural studies conducted in vitro in Dr. Weber's lab, we postulated an in vivo mechanism of S100 beta. So, I'm sorry, where's the pointer? So in, the, in, in a cell, is this it? Sorry. Oh, sorry, okay. So in a cell, S100 beta, APO, not bound to calcium, is in this conformation. So when you have an increase of intracellular calcium, the, when calcium binds, you have a structural conformational change. This is helix three of S100 beta, so it swings out and you expose this hydrophobic cleft, which is able to interact with target proteins to form a biological effect. So one of the proteins that S100-beta interacts with, we saw, we found, is P53. So you can imagine if you have elevated levels of S100-beta in a form of cancer, you can have downregulation of P53. So we came up with this Weber lab model using a P53-derived peptide from the C-terminal end of P53. So we saw that with elevated levels of S100 beta, it downregulated and bound to P53. But when you phosphorylate or acetylate P53 at the C-terminal end, S100 beta can no longer interact with it. And this is somewhat analogous to HDM2, which is a well-known P53 regulator. So when you phosphorylate the N-terminal end of P53, HDM2 can no longer interact with it. So you have high levels of P53, you have increased levels of transcriptional activity, and this leads to cell cycle arrest, senescence, apoptosis, et cetera. But in order, an additional regulation we believe is S100 beta. So the promoter of S100 beta has many binding sites for P53. So you can imagine a sort of feedback loop. You have elevated, elevated levels of P53, you get elevated levels of S100 beta, and you can downregulate it in a regulatory manner. Um, this is the work done by Dr. Lin, which is a former member of uh, Dr. Weber's lab. She showed that in a melanoma cell line, if you knock down expression of S100 beta using an siRNA, you get increased levels of P53 and its downstream target P21. So you can kind of see why it would be beneficial for us to discover a small molecule that disrupt this P53 S100 beta interaction. So the first step of our drug discovery strategy design is to solve the structure of protein the protein structure of S100 beta, and we did that a couple of years ago. The next step is to develop a high throughput screening method to screen random libraries of compounds that can potentially interact with S100 beta. The next step is to confirm that these compounds from this stage really do bind S100 beta using NMR experiments, uh, calculating the binding affinity, et cetera. From there, we take these lead compounds and we saw the structure of that compound bound to S100 beta using X-ray crystallography or NMR. The next step, we have a new protein structure bound to the compound, and then using structural activity relationship methods, how do we make that compound a better fit? How do we make that compound bind to S100 beta with a tighter affinity? And more importantly, how do we make these compounds go into cells to be clinically relevant? relevant? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the high throughput method that we developed is a fluorescence polarization competition assay. So what we did was we took that P53-derived peptide and stuck a FITC-labeled uh, compound at the N-terminal end of it. And we have already saw this structure. We know that this P53 peptide binds to that hydrophobic uh, cleft pocket that we talked to before, that, we ta that I talked about before. And what we did was we measured the anisotropy value 
So when this FITC labeled peptide is bound to S100 beta, it has a slower tumbling rate in solution, and you have a high polarization value, a high anisotropy. But when you, but when we screen the compounds, and if they're able to displace this FITC peptide, the FITC peptide label P53 tumbles a lot faster in solution, and you have a lower anisotropy value. And by um, slowly titrating in a certain compound, and we can measure the change in polarization value, we can determine the IC50 value. And from that, using mathematics that I'm not really sure of, we can measure, uh, we can calculate a KD, a dissociation constant. So I talked about how in stage three, we use uh, different experiments to confirm binding of a particular compound to S100 beta. And one of the experiments that we use is a simple HSQC, and we measure NMR perturbations. What an HSQC is, it it's a 2D NMR experiment that allows us to monitor each amide residue of, a, of, a, of an amino acid in a protein, in this case, S100 beta. So we take S100 beta, not bound to a compound or not bound to P53, and run an HSQC. Then we do the same thing with P53 or another compound bound to S100 beta and see what localized changes occur in the structure. And so, for example, when we take the P53 derived peptide and bind it to S100 beta, we see localized changes in helix 4, helix 3, and the hinge domain in S100 beta. We also saw the structure of S100 beta bound to compound 132, but we also see similar changes in helix 4 and in the hinge region, which makes sense, because if a compound can kick off this peptide, it should bind in similar areas as the peptide does. So like I mentioned earlier, we do have a uh, structural confirmation of compound 132 bound to uh, S100 beta, and we have the structure using X-ray crystallography. And from that point, what we did was we did similarity searches for compounds that look similar to 132. And using the FPCA assay, the fluorescence polarization composition assay, I was able to uh, determine IC50 values of these new compounds that look similar to 132. So what we're, we're trying to find is, what, what uh, chemical changes can make this a tighter binder? And, you know, you, that's not always the case. So, for example, for this compound here, when we cleaved off this lipophilic end side chain, the IC50 value increased dramatically. And what IC50 is, is the amount of compound it takes to kick off 50% of the peptide bound to S100 beta. So as you can see, the higher, the more quantity it takes to kick off the peptide, the less of a binder it is to S100 beta. So maybe somehow this lipophilic side chain is very important in the interaction. But then when I started adding hydrophobic residues to this end of the compound, the IC50 value decreased, meaning that this is a tighter binder than the original. Um, but when you add an, an extra methyl group, it's kind of cool that you see the IC50 value increases significantly. So maybe this hydrophobic residue is too big to fit in that cleft pocket that I mentioned earlier. Um, but interesting enough, when we add this bromine residue here, this bromine um, ion, it increases, uh, decreases the IC50 value, making it a tighter binder. So I'm, I'm doing more than just six compounds. We have like over 40 compounds for, that are SAR with 132, but I'm just showing a representative here today. And I show, I'm showing this last compound to, um, to make a point here that this thiourea group we see comes up in many of the compounds that we screen that is able to kick off the 50 peptide. And it's very important because, as you see, when we took off that thiourea group, the IC50 value increased significantly. And we do have secondary data, 1483, that I just gathered last week on um, 1483 bound to S100 beta. And this is just the raw data of an HSQC that I showed previously of the bar graphs. In black, you see the amide uh, protons of the amino acid residues not bound to compound 1483, but when we add it, the compound, you see that some uh, residues stay the same. For example, E91 or E2, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't change much upon binding, but certain residues do change. For example, this tyrosine right here or this, uh, this E31. So this is showing that, yes, 1483 does bind to S100 beta, and yes, we do have localized changes in structure. And we actually have some crystal formations of 1483 bound to S100 beta, and we collected data on that uh, actually two nights ago, and so we should have the structure solved soon. Um, another way we can determine how the compound fits into S100 beta is using this uh, new NMR experiment that I'm, not, that I'm not too familiar with, but I did it 
couple of weeks ago called saturation transfer difference. So what we do is we selectively saturate the receptor, or in this case S100 beta, with a magnetic pulse. And when the compound is bound to S100 beta, the, there's magnetization transfer to the protons that are closest to the interaction. And that's depicted here with the big protons compared to the small protons. And so since we talked about 132, we're we'll focus on that. Um, like I stated earlier, we saw that with the structure, that this part, this methyl group of compound 132 is embedded in that hydrophobic pocket. And it's confirmed using the saturation transfer difference. Because you can see this is a 1D uh, spectra. The peaks here is larger for, this meth for the protons in this methyl group, meaning that it's more embedded in that pocket. And so we do have um, <clears throat> the con this uh, compound, the structure bound to S100 beta. But why SAR studies are very important is because it appears that this compound cannot get into cells. So there's no clinical relevance to it. So we want to perform these SAR data to make these cells, make these compounds get into cell. And so for future work, we want to develop a cellular assay. And we're focusing on melanoma cell lines to see what to screen if these compounds do in fact get into cells. And then eventually we want to make a mouse model for these potential therapeutics. And I'm also focusing on other lead compounds besides 132. There's like seven or eight SAR studies that are going on at one time, but you know, for time constraints, I didn't put them up here. Um, I want to take, I want to thank the entire Weber lab, uh, Dr. Zahn and Dr. McCarroll at the Computer Aided Drug Design Center at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Varney at the NMR Center, she helps us run all of our uh, NMR programs, uh, especially the Meyerhoff Graduate Program and NIGMS for funding. <clears throat> Any questions? No. How specific are these components? Is there any data on side effects, toxic effects, or anything? Um, most of the compounds we're, we're studying, they're not well known. They're not known for their therapeutic value, except for um, no, <laughs> that I know of. So we're not sure yet. That's like. That would come along with like the mouse model and just test if any side effects that we see at all. Any other questions? Yes. Were um, any of the drugs rationally designed or were they all from your laboratory? Good question. Um, they came from both. So the CADD Center at um, the University of Maine School of Medicine, they, what they did was they used like a docking program. I'm not too familiar with it. So they took the structure, since we have the S100 beta structure and how the hydrophobic cleft pocket looks, they kind of just randomly see if different compounds can fit in there. And they made a, gave us a list of like 1,000 compounds to screen. And then we also just randomly screened compounds that we have in our lab to see. So they came from both. 